Hi there, Allison here with another Cab Franc du Jour. Today's wine is taking us to Uruguay, more specifically the region of Maldonado. And we're looking at the Bodega Garçon 2018 Cabernet Franc Tanat. Bodega Garçon is the vision of businessman Alejandro Bucarone, who established the winery in 2008. With a deep respect for the natural biodiversity of this expansive 1500 hectare estate, the 240 hectares of vines are planted among native flora and fauna, including a 200 hectare nature reserve. This commitment to biodiversity and sustainability extends to the winery, which is the first silver LEED certified winemaking facility outside North America. Under the guidance of renowned winemaking consultant Alberto Antonini and analogist Herman Bruzzone, in a short period of time, Bodega Garçon has really helped to put Uruguay on the world wine map. The Uruguay wine industry is vastly different than the two countries that we typically think about when we think of South American wine, namely Chile and Argentina. So in Uruguay, we have around 5,991 hectares under vine, and the country's production ranges from around 600,000 liters to a million liters, depending on the vintage. And this is 0.07% of the output of just Argentina. And the climate here in Uruguay is also very different from its South American neighbors. It's the only country on the continent whose climate is strongly influenced by the Atlantic Ocean. And this brings more rainfall, humidity, and cooler temperatures to the viticultural areas here in Uruguay. And this means that the country actually experiences more of a moderate maritime climate. And also, it's important to note that Uruguay also experiences uh, a lot more vintage variation than what we would typically see in Chile and Argentina. And for this reason, uh, author Amanda Barnes notes in her book that she thinks that Uruguay has a lot more in common with, say, Galicia or Bordeaux uh, in terms of uh, its climate and whatnot uh, than its South American neighbors. And for this reason, she calls Uruguay this small old world winemaking country in this large uh, South American New World winemaking continent. Now, many of us know that Tana is the flagship grape of Uruguay, and for good reason. This grape hails from southwest France, and it seems to really like these maritime conditions. What's more is its thick skins actually help to uh, stave off the natural humidity, the higher natural humidity that we find here. The first Tanat vines were actually planted here in Uruguay by a Basque native, a gentleman by the name of Pascual Ariag, back in 1871. And today, Tana accounts for around about a quarter or so of the vineyard area, about 1,610 hectares uh, currently under vine. Now, my experience with Cabernet Franc from Uruguay is, I will admit, quite limited, but I do see a lot of potential for this grape variety here for a few reasons. So first and foremost, from what we know, Cabernet Franc's birthplace is Basque country. Yeah, the border of France and Spain right on the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and we see from other examples like Bordeaux and Bulgari that Cabernet Franc seems to really like these uh, coastal sites, these places that have a strong maritime influence. What's more is that Cabernet Franc is actually planted alongside Tanat in a number of appellations in southwest France, such as Euroligui and Bayam. So while there is only around 237 hectares of Cabernet Franc in the ground currently in Uruguay, I do think that this grape has, uh, has a really, really bright future in this country. So let's look at the viticultural areas of Uruguay quickly. Uh, so there's two main areas here where we find the majority of the vineyard plantings. We have this area that is, uh, com encompasses these two regions of Canelones and Montevideo, and this accounts for around 76% of the total area under vine in the country. And then we have this area called uh, to the east, the eastern coast here. Uh, and this area is actually comprised of three distinct regions. We have Maldonado, Roca, and La Vieja. And where Bodega de Garzón is located, we are in Maldonado. So that is going to be the focus of our terroir dive today. So while the region of Maldonado's viticultural history actually dates back to about 1890, uh, the modern story of this region is really quite, uh, quite recent, uh, with the first commercial plantings being established here only in the early 2000s. So currently, Maldonado has around 411 hectares under vine. That's about a tenth of what we find in uh, Canelones to the west. 
And Maldonado starts about 70 kilometers east of the capital city of Montevideo, and it stretches around uh, 85 kilometers to, uh, from west to east, and the region can actually be subdivided into five subregions. And what's important to note uh, in terms of the climate here in Uruguay is as we move further east uh, along the coast, we're actually getting into cooler conditions as well as drier conditions. Uh, but that is all relative, of course, because here in Maldonado, they still get a decent amount of rainfall, about 1,040 millimeters of rainfall annually. Now, where Bodega Garzón is located, it is in the subregion of Garzón, uh, and this area is uh, the furthest east of all the subregions in Maldonado. And in terms of where we are situated here, we're at about 34.6 degrees south latitude. That's uh, similar to Colchagua in Chile, San Rafael in Argentina, Waco Bay in South Africa, and the Eden Valley in, uh, in Australia, just to kind of put that all into perspective here. Uh, and where we are at Bodega Garcon, we're actually only 18 kilometers, less than like 11 miles or so inland from the Atlantic Ocean. So the influence from this massive body of water really cannot be understated. First, we have these marine fogs that come in in the morning and that helps to delay the warming of the vineyards. And then we have in the afternoon, we have these strong ocean breezes that come in and that helps to drop the overall vineyard temperature. And it also helps to reduce humidity uh, and thus disease pressure. Now what's also important to note about the climate here is that altitude really doesn't uh, come into play. It's not really a factor in terms of the microclimate, not to the same extent, I should say, uh, as we see altitude influencing climate in say uh, Argentina. Rather, uh, the, the sort of the landscape here in Garzón and Maldonado, we have this very hilly, undulating landscape, but the elevations only range from around 60 meters above sea level up to about 150 meters above sea level. So we don't see the same temperature swings here in this area. Rather, the combination of the elevation as well as this maritime climate gives this area a bit more of a long, gentle, moderate uh, growing season. Now at Bodega Garçon, they have around 20 hectares of Cabernet Franc vines planted. Uh, and if you look at this vineyard area via satellite, you know, on Google Maps or Google Earth or something like that, it is just this incredible labyrinth of plots. There is uh, different elevations, different slopes, different exposures. It's really quite a sight to behold. And they've actually uh, parceled their 240 hectares of vines into more than a thousand distinct plots here and each of these parcels is vinified individually if you can believe it. It's just uh, pretty pretty wild to think about it. Um, the soils here at Bodega Garçon are, are worth noting. So the soils here are this uh, weathered granite that they call balasto and these soils are so old they actually their origin dates back to around 2500 million years ago. That makes them some of the oldest soils on the planet. The texture of the soils is worth noting. It's this free draining sandy loam texture. Um, and because of this free draining texture, it helps to kind of help to eliminate some of that uh, moisture that we get here. Um, the depth of the topsoil ranges anywhere from about 50 centimeters to upwards to, uh, or as deep as three meters, I should say, uh, depending of course on, on the uh, parcels. And this, uh, this free draining soil, as well as the low fertility of the soil, is really the reason why uh, high quality viticulture has become uh, quite successful here at Garçon uh, in this area and also Maldonado in general. So getting to today's wine, this is a blend of 80% uh, Cabernet Franc and 20% Tanat. And it's coming from 16 hectares of Cabernet Franc vines that were planted in 2009 and 2010. And they've actually since planted more Cabernet Franc at Bodega Garçon in uh, 2018. And they're actually working with uh, two clones here, the clone 327 and the clone 214. And this is the Bordeaux and the Loire clone respectively. Um, and I, you know, we don't talk a lot about clones as it relates to Cabernet Franc, but in terms of my research, you know, I've noted that actually these two clones dominate plantings globally for Cabernet Franc, which I find, uh, you know, absolutely uh, fascinating here.
Now, uh, in terms of the winemaking for this wine, uh, we are basically, essentially, the Cabernet Franc and the Tanat are vinified exactly the same. So we're dealing with de-stemmed fruit here, actually I should say hand-picked fruit and de-stemmed fruit, and it's lightly crushed. Uh, and then fermentation takes place in these um, uh, 8,000 liter concrete vats, uh, and they do do some light pump overs during the fermentation. They're really not trying to extract too much. They really want to keep it gentle, uh, they told me. Uh, and the wine stays on skins for about seven days, so not a long time on skins. And then aging takes place in a combination, or, or excuse me, in just a 2,500 liter uh, oak food where the wine rests then for about 16 months before it is then bottled. So. That is nearly 11 minutes of a lot of information and I am thirsty. So let's see what this wine is giving us today. Mm. Wow, so uh, on the nose, it immediately you sense that there's, this is coming from somewhere a little bit warmer, but it's not, it's by no means uh, overripe or, or too, uh, too ripe or too jammy. It's really quite lovely actually. The fruits do lean a little bit more on the uh, sweeter side of things. Uh, like I'm getting a little bit of like a strawberry preserve note. There's a touch of um, like a bit of a red plum, black plum thing going on. A touch of cherry here as well. And the pyrazines are dialed uh, way back here, like the, quite low in the grand scheme of things. You know, you still know it's Cabernet Franc, but the pyrazines are quite low. And that makes sense because uh, the majority of the Cabernet Franc, uh, the winery told me, is actually planted on uh, west facing slopes here. Uh, and that will help to maximize the stronger afternoon sunshine, which will help to minimize pyrazines. Um, but yes, the pyrazines are there. We do get a little bit of a dusty, um, like a dusty herb note. I'm getting a touch of bay leaf, a little bit of oregano. There's even a little bit of like a fennel seed thing happening here, which I quite like. And the nose is quite spicy as well. There's a nice plethora of spices going on here. A little bit of white pepper. There's a little bit of even um, uh, Chinese five spice powder here too, but I really like the nose. Very sort of, it has a nice ripeness to it, a sweet profile, very lovely. Mm. On the palate, all those same sweeter, slightly red and dark fruits come through really nicely. And that spiciness is really pronounced, which I absolutely love. And, um, and then the, actually, I would say that the piercings come forward a little bit more on the palate, which is nice. It provides this kind of counterpoint to the sweeter fruit profile, which is cool. Mm. Now, the acidity is really lovely. It's super fresh lively there's a juiciness to the acidity which is fantastic and the tannins i gotta say this is where this is where i think the tannat comes into play because i think the cab franc really leads for the most part uh, with this wine but on in terms of the tannins on the palate this is where the tannat kind of comes into play so the tannins hit differently you can tell that there's something else going on here because the tannins kind of fill the mouth like they're all over the place uh, and they have a slight chew to them a bit more of a sinewy uh, kind of chew to the tannins and i actually like that because there's this as i mentioned you know there's this sort of sweeter fruit profile and the way the juicy acidity works i actually think those tannins provide a nice counterpoint uh, to the palate experience with this wine Yeah, there's a nice fleshiness to the wine, super balanced, like just impeccably balanced, which I really, really like. There's a distinctiveness to this wine. I'm getting like a little bit of a smoky ash thing as well on the finish. So there is this character, there is this distinctiveness to this wine, which I think is really terrific. Um, and what's also interesting is I feel like it feels really contemp uh, contemporary to me. Um, so it's like there's this respect for the past, but also, you know, a vision for the future. Like also they can kind of, there's a nod to the future as well and a respect for modern uh, techniques and, and processes. But I do feel, it does have this contemporary feel, which I quite like. Super approachable, really delicious. Um, it's just a, it's just a fantastic bottle of wine and it's a great value. Uh, this retails in Ontario for 20 bucks. Uh, which is uh, an amazing way uh, to introduce yourself to Uruguayan wine. Um, and I'm sure it's even cheaper uh, elsewhere, but uh, I don't know. When I started doing the research for this video and emailing with the estate and watching some videos on YouTube, I'm, I have to admit, 
I, I am smitten with Uruguay and I really, I'm really excited by uh, Cabernet Franc's potential in this country and I hope I can find more, more examples of Cabernet Franc from, from Uruguay at some point in the future and maybe get there uh, at some point. Um, but I, I think this is a really important piece of the Cabernet Franc story is Uruguay and I look forward to seeing uh, more Cabernet Franc from this country going forward. If you have had the pleasure of trying a Cabernet Franc from Uruguay, please let me know what you thought of it in the comments below, who the producer was uh, and the whole bit, because uh, I really do want to know uh, so I can track these wines down myself. And of course, as always, I will be back again soon with another wine. Thank you for watching. Cheers.